Hello everyone, my name's Sarah Turner and I'm Acting Director at the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art and it's my pleasure to introduce um, our speaker tonight, Hetty Judah, um, and to start off this event, which is really, Mel used a great word earlier when we were chatting, a gathering, and I think that's what's wonderful about um, an event like this, which has space to breathe and let ideas unfold over time, because I think we'll need to return to the ideas and the thoughts that we hear and share um, over the space um, of the weekend. So it's great to have this gathering point around an exhibition where we can be together and, and use the breaks and the lunch times and the Q&A to just really unpick things and, and, and share some um, ideas together. So thanks so much for creating that gathering moment. And um, Hetty, it's wonderful that you agreed to join us um, this week weekend and to start things off and many of you in this room will need no introduction to Hetty Judah's uh, work especially her 2020 study of the impact of motherhood on artist careers and the how not to exclude artist mothers and other parents which was initially a response to the Freelance Foundation annual report about the representation of female artists in Britain and um, if you follow Hetty on uh, social media you know you you will know that this sort of exploded and went viral very quickly into a conversation that created a community of interest and a dialogue which was really interesting to see unfold and the report's been translated into many languages and I was really you know following you and following that conversation really interested to see the global impact of this work as well um, and it's also been published as a book by uh, Lund Humphreys. Hetty is also widely published as an art critic um, and author. And again, um, as Shreya said, this, this uh, whole event, and Hetty's talk as well, starts with Barbara Hepworth, but I think, again, extends outwards and opens up ideas and readings that we'll be mulling over for the rest of the weekend and indeed beyond. And I hope that we will keep connected in many ways beyond this weekend and, and keep these conversations going. So please join me in welcoming Hetty Judah to give a presentation. Hello. Um, before I start, I'd like to give a content warning. This talk will include, among other subjects, the mention of infant mortality and maternal loss. Um, good evening. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to Katie Norris and Melanie, who's over there, um, and the team at Tates and Ives for inviting me, and to the Paul Mellon Centre for supporting this event, and the travel bursaries offered to those attending. My opening question this evening is this. What happens when we identify the artist as a mother? The burgeoning art world interest in maternity has led many of us, myself included, to revisit our histories of art on the hunt for mothers. When we find them, for there are many, it is hard to resist looking at their work through this lens, to search for clues as to the artist's status as a mother or as someone who has lost a child, or who has experienced miscarriage, or abortion, or infertility, or who has defied the social conventions of their time in rejecting marriage and the domestic realm. What whispers of maternity and its related struggles or joys can we find in their art? As with the ongoing mission to bring the histories of art by women into general public discourse, excitement can get the better of us. Simply for that mythic creature, the artist mother, to be made visible can feel empowering. There is a long-held feminist imperative to construct histories of art that privilege difference, diversity, co-creation, collaborative practices, and a broad range of life experiences. Making the lived experience of maternity visible within art histories seems like a definitive step away from the Martinian cigars era of art writing. This evening, I'd like to try to look at this subject with fresh eyes. This presentation is titled Babs, after a work by Kathy Pilkington. Pilkington often tests the limits of what we comfortably indicate through the word sculpture, drawing on the aesthetic language of modelled forms beyond the arena of fine art, among them decorative figurines, public monuments, and toy dolls. 
She also explores the persona of the artist and the prejudices we might carry about the kind of person who makes art. Pilkington invites us to think about the influence an artist biography has on our reading of their work. Babs is a small sculpture made in 2010. At the center is a cartoonish figure, a sexy lady duck wearing high heels and a little frilly skirt. She's heavily lacquered, ultra shiny, as though the material itself is sweating. We've caught the duck in a frenzied moment of making. Dribbles of plaster spatter her arms and legs, and puddles of it drool across the floor as she races to give form to a new sculpture on a high plinth. All around her are roughly finished sculptures, pierced forms of a type we associate with a certain very famous female artist active in the mid-century. Babs is a sculpture about making sculpture, and it's also a sculpture about the messy slippage between private life and public work. This sexy, chaotic figure is not how we think of Barbara Hepworth. Thanks to the ongoing fetishization of the artist's person and studio practice, stretching from picture post magazine through the Pathé newsreels to publications such as What Artists Wear, we have a received image of Hepworth, neatly attired, utilitarian chic, elegant, if a little severe. Unlike Babs, Barbara always seems supremely in control. Yet Hepworth really did have all of these complicating factors in her life. As Eleanor Clayton so brilliantly outlined in her biography of Hepworth, there were many periods during which she felt completely overwhelmed and struggled to cope. As a single parent, a woman pregnant with triplets, a caregiver to four children, the primary source of household income, and the mother of a child who suffered serious illness and received hospital care away from home during wartime. This talk will take two substantial detours, framed by some discussion of Barbara Hepworth as an artist's mother. In the first detour, I'd like to propose Kathy Pilkington's Babs as a useful paradigm. Looking into art history for evidence of artists who were also mothers can be double-edged. In fetishizing artists of previous generations who balance the twin demands of maternity and art, we risk diminishing ourselves. Whichever artists we look to from the past, I believe there will have been specific forces at play that made art possible, as well as periods of great difficulty and struggle. Those who made it work usually did so with assistance, whether domestic or professional and those who persevered with minimal assistance had a very tough time indeed, and, the, and even to the point of damaging their health. I'd like to propose that to a greater or lesser extent, any successful artist's mother will have had periods in which she was an overstretched Babs, panicked, sleep-deprived, angry crying, and laboring away out of sight. Often when I talk about art and motherhood, I'll start with this painting. This is an early work attributed to Artemisia Gentileschi, painted in 1613, the year in which she gave birth to the first of her five children. The popular narrative around Artemisia focuses on her experience of sexual violence, public trial and torture. The girl-boss feminism take on Artemisia has her as a woman wronged with a taste for bloody revenge it doesn't tend to consider Artemisia as a mother. I have in the past suggested this painting may be the first depiction in the European tradition of a woman breastfeeding a child by a woman who has herself breastfed a child. I ask how it changes things if we think of this artist as a mother. In her essay, An Intimate Look at Baroque Women Artists, Births, Babies and Biography, Freema fox Hofrichter notes that the considerable scholarship applied to the early lives of women artists and the influence of their fathers has not been matched by study on the impact of maternity and marriage. They are considered as daughters, in other words, but not as mothers. Hofrichter looks at periods of key artistic production for four women artists active in the 17th century in relation to childbirth and examines the role played by social conventions related to nursing and family planning. As it turns out, 
My idea that Artemisia was painting the nursing Madonna from a position of personal experience may be incorrect. I made the mistake of imposing 21st century middle-class British maternity norms onto a high society Florentine body of the 17th century. Artemisia was married in 1612 at the age of 19 and had four children over the next six years. Although the pacing of these births would allow for her to have nursed her children, for a Florentine woman of her social position, it would have been unusual. It is likely that Artemisia instead placed them with a wet nurse. In Artemisia's case, we can imagine the impact of wet nursing was twofold. On the one hand, it released her from the relentless and repetitive labor of breastfeeding her own children, leaving her free to pursue her work as an artist. She was also unwittingly putting her children at risk. Infant mortality was higher among babies who attended by a wet nurse. Three of the four children Artemisia had in Florence died. It may well have been the combined strain of work, childbirth, debts run up by her husband, and the deaths of her children, a feeling of being completely overwhelmed, in other words, that prompted Artemisia to leave Florence and escape to Rome in 1620, marking the start of what we now think of as her mature career. Hofrichter compares Artemisia's career after marriage to that of Judith Leister. In the Netherlands in the 17th century, maternal nursing was promoted as an emblematic gesture of motherly love and care. According to the Dutch poet and politician Jacob Katz, one who bears her children is a mother in part, but she who nurses her children is mother completely. It was believed at the time that sexual intercourse would taint breast milk, harming the milk supply and perhaps the baby. A pattern can be detected among Dutch women of the time, with births paced evenly every couple of years, suggesting 12 months or so of breastfeeding before the recommencement of sexual contact with a husband and a subsequent pregnancy. Leister was married in 1636, at the age of 27. She had five children, of whom only two survived her. All of Leicester's significant known works are dated prior to her marriage, which has led to an assumption that once married, she was not permitted to continue her work as a professional artist. But Hofrichter suggests that the break in Leicester's work is more likely to have been caused by the labor of childbirth and breastfeeding and grief for her lost children. Only a few examples survive, but it seems that, as a mother, Leicester turned to painting still life arrangements. The first dated work by her after marriage are two drawings of tulips, executed for a sales catalogue in 1643, made in the months after the baptism of her daughter, Helena. I think anyone who has tried to keep working from home with very young children will recognize that the switch from portraits and genre scenes to still lives and botanical studies is one that reflects the challenges of life as a parent to young children. As well as considering the impact of maternity on artists such as Artemisia Gentileschi and Judith Leister, we should also consider the impact of multiple bereavements. There can be a glib assumption that because infant mortality rates were so much higher in the 17th century, people took the death of a child in their stride. But I would argue that we should allow for the idea that these artists suffered terrible heartbreak, and that in the case of Leister, it was possibly the loss of her first three children that stopped her painting. Experience of parental grief in this period includes examples of paintings in which the dead children are included in family portraits alongside the living. This painting from 1621 shows three surviving babies, Peter, Janet, and Maria, in lace swaddling robes, arranged on the bed around their dead sibling, Elizabeth. Looking forward to Katie Norris's presentation tomorrow on Hepworth, Motherhood and Loss, I would like to propose this awareness of loss as something we carry with us when we consider the maternal experience art historically. We're going to jump forward 300 years now and join Barbara Hepworth in Italy, where we find her on a traveling scholarship as a young artist. Hepworth met the sculptor John Skeeping at the British School in Rome at the end of 1924 and they were married the following May. Their relationship coincided with Hepworth's maturation as a sculptor. 
It was in Rome that her attention turned to carving stone, where she started to appreciate the importance of light to her work and where she acquired a passion for marble. Already at this stage, she wrote with great passion about the relationship between hand and material, as though the physical intensity of her relationship with Skeeping extended into the stone she was working with. The couple moved back to London at the end of 1626. For some reason, I find this photograph very funny. It's <laughs> something slightly ridiculous about it. Um, and rented a live-work studio space in which they held a joint exhibition in the summer of 1920, 1927. It was at, the, at this early stage that Hepworth started exploring the mother and child as subject. As we will discuss shortly, Maternity was, for many reasons, an important subject for artists working between the wars. Nevertheless, motherhood was also soon to become part of Hepworth's lived reality. Her son, Paul, was born in August 1929. The hardwood carving infant was made in the same year, a glossy baby form that suggests that this little human is a strong and independent ent entity. While the baby is carved as though lying on its back, it is presented upright like a temple sculpture. At this stage, Hepworth was working in what, for better or worse, I'm going to call direct carving, finding a form in the material. So in sculptural terms, we might also imagine her in the position of the midwife, bringing the baby forth from the wood that once contained it. As Anne Wagner has pointed out, this was an important analogy for the creative process in Hepworth's time. The title of Wagner's book, Mother Stone, is in itself a reference to what geologists term the matrix, the mother rock from which a mineral must be extracted. The term dates to classical antiquity and the earliest alchemical writings. Wagner starts Mother Stone with a discussion of a frieze by Jacob Epstein, in which the creator figure is a male sculpture holding aloft a baby partially emerged from its matrix, its mother rock. Hepworth recalled this period of, early, of her own early motherhood as a happy one. Home and studio were under one roof. She hired a nanny to help take care of Paul and found herself energized to work while he slept. Hepworth and Skeeping continued to show together to some success, but by the early 1930s, their marriage was in trouble. In 1931, the couple met Ben and Winifred Nicholson, artists with a young family that included a daughter the same age as Paul. In September of that year, Hepworth went on holiday to Haysborough in Norfolk with Paul, then two, and a group of artist friends, including Henry and Irina Moore and Ivan Hitchens. Sculpture was on the menu. Hepworth and Moore carved while Paul played on the beach. Hepworth wrote to Nicholson, inviting him to join her, and set the scene in material tones. She sent Nicholson pictures of rock formations photographed while on an earlier boat trip in the Scilly Isles, admiring their fundamental thrust, retained after centuries of violent erosion. Nicholson took the bait and left his wife Winifred looking after the couple's new baby to join the artist group on the Norfolk coast. Hepworth's relationship with Stone was intense and tactile. She conceived of her materials having a kind of life force. I don't think that it would be too far-fetched to find a degree of continuum in the heightened sensuality of this period of her personal life and the way that she approached and handled materials and form. Indeed, Clayton includes a line from a letter to Nicholson in 1933, in which Hepworth declares, I think the thing to work at, this work at is that work and living is the same thing. All is one movement. I think this suite of holiday photographs say something important about Hepworth's Melia and might help us understand decisions that she made in the following years and the challenges that she faced. That's um, Henry Moore's bottom, by the way, in case you've ever wanted to see it. <laughs> um, this is a group of artists fully embracing the idea of an unconventional modern life. In this now rather quaint spectacle of men and women playing naked cricket on the beach, we can sense a radical departure from the prim respectability of the cultural mainstream. Hepworth and Nicholson became lovers. She and Skeeping divorced. It had only been in 1923, less than 10 years earlier, that the Matrimonial Causes Act allowed women to petition for divorce in the UK on the grounds of either adultery or violence. Divorce was considered a source of shame and potential scandal. In this period, Nicholson remained in a kind of open marriage with Winifred 
and divided his time between Hepworth and his family. Hepworth and Nicholson were, were not married until 1938. Looking through the lens of contemporary discourse at this period, I'd like to playfully propose Hepworth as an archetypal sodomitical mother within the British art world. Sodomitical maternity was a phrase coined by Susan Freeman in her book Cool Men and the Second Sex, and a term greatly popularized by Maggie Nelson in The Argonauts. It is a label that Freeman uses to indicate a mother with a sexuality that is in excess of her procreative capacity. A mother, in other words, who has sex for the pleasure of it. We can also use the term to iron out the troublesome polarity that exists between the archetypal countercultural bohemian rebel figure on the one extreme and the mother at the other. As Freeman points out, according to that axis, the mother was, by definition, the antithesis of cool. Sodomitical maternity undermines assumptions about reproduction and the notion that selfless caregiving is part of a woman's intrinsic nature. Becoming a single parent in the early 1930s put Hepworth in a situation that was financially and socially precarious. As a young artist with a public reputation, the divorce received unkind coverage in the press. Although Skeeping shared care of Paul and contributed to the household, she struggled to cover domestic expenses and childcare. As a result, Hepworth took on tutoring work and branched out into printmaking, designing patterns for domestic textiles. She was often dog-tired from having to work late into the night after Paul slept. She wrote to Nicholson about having to work between 6.30 at night and 3 in the morning after a day of childcare and housework. Nevertheless, this was a period of tremendous creative energy for Hepworth, boosted in no small way by the intoxicating intellectual and physical relationship with Nicholson. There's a beautiful letter to Nicholson quoted in Clayton's biography in which Hepworth addresses Christian science's emphasis on spiritual over the material and how that worldview fails to make space for sexual pleasure. She writes, Science will not admit of the necessity of sex harmony. It says we must get above it if we are in disharmony. How can we cut out the most lovely thing that God has created, the quiet strength and urge that makes a flower force its way out of the beaten earth, or raise its head after much trampling, that makes all that quiet, still movement in the night of things growing, growing to new loveliness and light. It is the rhythm of the seasons, and the heart of the earth, and sea and sands, and the very stillness of understanding, as deep as the blue of sky in the night. Moving towards abstraction, Hepworth carved her first, her first pierced work, a small sculpture in pink alabaster through which she brought space and light into the heart of a stone form. I have in the past, with a knowing turn of phrase, noted that Hepworth described the experience of piercing the sculpture as one of intense pleasure. There is certainly a sexual potency to work she was making in the early 1930s. In this period, Hepworth also made a number of small sculptures exploring the theme of the mother and child. As previously noted, Hepworth was far from alone in exploring this theme in the early 20th century. But her treatment was both exciting and distinctive. Many important and indeed contradictory ideas were circulating at this time relating to early childhood development. There were radical experiments in education and theories about the new ways that we might imagine a family. To take one informative example, and I, I want to mention this in particular for anyone who's been reading Sophie Lewis and Full Surrogacy now, because I think this bears extraordinary resemblance to a lot of contemporary ideas about the kind of new family structure. So to take one informative example, in 1927, the philosopher Bertrand Russell and his wife, the feminist and educator Dora Black, founded Beacon Hill, a progressive boarding school for children aged two and upwards. Black wrote of the school's basic principle of democracy, which defines each child as a unique individual who belongs not to the state or even to his parents, but first of all to himself. Russell firmly believed that the small modern family was a stifling environment for a child, writing in 1931, most love is a prison, mother love not least so. 
It was Russell's view at the time that a more sensible model would involve a number of families with young children cohabiting in a large household with a common nursery. He complained to a friend that, as things stand, however, middle-class people are too quarrelsome for arrangements of that sort. Beacon Hill thus offered an alternative through which young children might be raised together in a setting that offered them a considerable degree of self-determination. Dora Russell was a Freudian, and I think it fair to say that her principles would have found little accord with Melanie Klein, whose landmark publication, The Psychoanalysis of Children, came out in 1932 and placed great value on the early maternal bond. In sculptural terms, many ideas in circulation at the time proposed the infant as raw material from which the adult was to be formed. I would like to suggest that in creating these radical works, in which the mother and child appear as separate but interrelated objects cut from the same stone, Hepworth was informed as much by her own experience of maternity as she was by new ideas about the mother-child relationship. There is an essential assertion of individuality of both mother and child needing to be their own person. Normally, this would be the revelatory moment in which I'd talk about Hepworth's pregnancy and the triplets that she would have with Nicholson in October 1934, but I think you all know how that story goes. So I'm going to take my second detour here, traveling back 40 years into the last decade of the 19th century. I'm going to start with a suite of symbolist paintings by Giovanni Segantini. The first is The Punishment of Lust, and it hangs in the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool. Segantini confects a scene of women in a state of suspended animation, floating amid snowy mountaintops. This is barren terrain, imagined as the place of torment for aborting mothers, women who have rejected motherhood in favor of a life of sensuality. The second is The Evil Mothers, which hangs in the Belvedere in Vienna. Here, women who have rejected maternity are ensnared in the tangled trees of an alpine landscape, trapped in position. Their bare breasts now nourish babies sprouting from the branches, finally bringing these women to a state of natural wholeness by fulfilling their role as nurturing mother. These two works are part of a larger series and present a flip side to the fetishization of the maternal body in art around the turn of the 20th century. As Wendy Slatkin writes in her essay, Maternity and Sexuality in the 1890s, art that glorified the pregnant and maternal figure as a natural force in this period, and that includes paintings by Gauguin, Klimt, and Morris Denny, did so against the backdrop of feminism, the battle for women's suffrage, and the emergence of the new woman. The idealized fertility figures of this period tended to be imagined as mythic creatures, representing womanhood in an idealized natural or primitive form. Slatkin writes, it is possible to interpret the pronounced avoidance of depictions of contemporary women as an uneasiness or outright fear of such changes in women's status. These male artists were not depicting women who sought equality with men, but rather were seeking to define the unchanging essence of womanhood an essence which denied women political rights or individuality while worshipping her generative power. We might see Segantini's evil mothers, and indeed the sensual baby eaters of Bram Stoker's novel Dracula, which was written in 1897, as forms of mythic caution against women with unnatural appetites, who enjoyed non-procreative sex, who wished to work outside the home, and who fought for a political voice. I'm going to talk briefly about Paula Modersen Becker and how fluctuating attitudes towards her work reflect the problematic political context of the turn to maternity as a subject in this period. In Old Mistresses, Griselda Pollock and Rosica Parker point out Modersen Becker's preference for, for depicting peasant women and write, her representations inflected by her class position and her allegiance to reactionary German ideologies about the earth, nature and natural woman were comparable to Gauguin's vision of his Polynesian Eves. Woman was, for both, unchanging, elemental, and unnatural. Pollock and Parker's position ignores both Modest and Becker's distinctive, distinct personal ambivalence about her own motherhood and her involvement in the socialist-aligned League for the Protection of Mothers. The meaning of the image of motherhood was not fixed and moved over the course of Modest and Becker's short career from a relatively sentimental test treatment in which the figure of the peasant mother is imagined as a heroic model, moral figure 
to something closer to a, a universal archetype. The anxiety around Modest and Becker's treatment of the mother and the rural peasant mother in particular is understandable, since the, sub the subject was and would continue to be highly politicized. The mother figure as a subject for art in the early 20th century was the bearer of multiple associations, often contradictory and from both extremes of the political spectrum. In the eyes of the new woman, motherhood started to be understood as a choice rather than the inevitable and natural order of things. To a declining birth rate due to industrialization and the increasing availability of birth control was added a huge loss of life during First World, the, the First World War. There was talk in Germany, as elsewhere, of a population crisis. The figure of the mother thus carried the weight of anxiety over women's changing position in society. A woman who left her children to work outside the home, or who was, for other reasons, judged to have insufficiently devoted herself to childcare and the domestic realm, was labelled a Rabenmutter, or raven mother, a term still in currency today. Her obverse, the good mother, the unpaid mother, caregiver, nurturer, who devoted herself to childbearing, nursing and keeping home, was an ideal promoted by nationalist movements. She would provide the workers and the cannon fodder of tomorrow. The peasant mother, in particular, became an emblem of wholesome traditional values that stood against the decadence of the modern city. By contrast, the urban working mother was often depicted as the ultimate victim of poverty in a highly divided society. An early print by Kathy Colvitz shows pregnancy as a burden to the working class woman. Unlike the middle class new woman, she had no easy access to contraception and was more likely to be prosecuted for the crime of abortion. With the formation of the Weimar Republic in 1918, German women gained the right to vote, and as a group acquired a new political heft. Led by the League for the Protection of Mothers and Sexual Reform, abortion and women's bodily autonomy became heated subjects, prompting public demonstrations and protests. Attempting to woo female voters, the Communist Party embraced the cause and lobbied for the legalization of abortion throughout the 1920s and into the 1930s, commissioning Colwitz to design a poster, publicizing their commitment to the cause. Writing about images of motherhood in Weimar Germany, Michelle Vangen outlines how, in the decades after her death in 1907, Modest and Becker's representations of motherhood were appropriated by those on the political right. Several works, including The Kneeling Mother and Child and The Reclining Mother and Child, were purchased by the nationalist entrepreneur Ludwig Roselius. In 1927, Roselius opened the Paola, Bo Paola Becker Modison House as part of a propagandistic museum complex dedicated to German art and artifacts that he had constructed in Bremen. In texts and public talks, Roselius held Modison Becker up as an example of a true Nordic artist forging a new German tradition. There is, of course, nothing intrinsic to the artworks themselves that merits such a reading. Roselius' interpretation did not reflect Modest and Becker's intention with these works. Indeed, by 1935, Modest and Becker's mother and child paintings were condemned in Germany for lacking a sensitive maternal womanly quality and came to be considered examples of degenerate art. But I think this historic episode bears retelling to illustrate how free-floating the mother body was as a political symbol at this time. While the political situation in Germany was more extreme, we should be aware that the interest in maternity as a subject for art in the early 20th century was not a specifically British phenomenon. And in exploring the mother figure, artists in Britain were responding to many of the same stimuli as their contemporaries in Germany. A greater understanding of human reproduction the changing role of women in society, scare stories about a population crisis and debates around birth control and population growth promoted by various political factions, nationalist groups among them. As I think we are all aware, early discourse around Planned Parenthood in Britain and the United States was informed by the pseudoscience of eugenics and tightly bound up in racist, classist and ableist principles. We returned to Barbara Hepworth in October of 1934 as she gave birth to triplets. Oh, I've skipped forward. Um, 
and as Ben Nicholson returns to Winifred and his three other three children in December. This is, I would say, Barbara Hepworth entering her full Babs face. She's taken a huge risk, following her heart, living as a divorcee and supporting herself and her son through her work as an artist in the middle of the Great Depression. She is a single woman who has had children by a married man in a society in which this is highly unusual and disapproved of. Suddenly, she has four children to care for, three of them underweight newborns, and not enough help to look after them, let alone make art. She writes to Nicholson about her joy in the babies, but also a feeling overwhelmed, and worries that if things continue as they are, she might never work again. I think back to the way people used to talk about Hepworth, sneering that she was a hard-bitten careerist who sent her children away. Because as a society, we love to judge and disapprove of mothers, even if we don't describe them as raven mothers. And I think about the lived reality of being in the impossible situation in which she found herself. She had few options available. This is still 14 years before the National Assistance Act of 1948, which would introduce income support, family allowance, and the National Health Service. While her decision to place the triplets in the Wellgarth Nursery Training College may seem extraordinary according to contemporary British parenting values, it was quite in keeping with progressive ideas of the time. Wellgarth itself was founded in response to profound social change. Established in 1911 as the first college to train working-class girls to become professional nursery nurses. The trainees provided residential care to the very young children of working women as part of their formation. Early in 1935, the triplets, Rachel, Sarah and Simon, were placed at Wellgarth, then located in Hampstead Garden, Hampstead Garden suburb, near to Hepworth Studio, and were looked after there for about a year. As we know, the family moved to St Ives during the war, and even with a nanny, Hepworth really struggled to find time to fit work in around her household duties, teaching and caring for the children and growing vegetables. She made time for art at night and in short intervals during the day, and this working practice in turn had an impact on what she was able to make, largely drawings and works in plaster. I've slowly discovered how to create for 30 minutes, cook for 40 minutes, create for another 30, and look after children for 50, and so on throughout the day. It's a sort of miracle to be able to do it. I think the secret lies in not resisting the chores and drudgery and in carrying the creative mood on with oneself while cooking so that it's unbroken, she wrote in 1941. Such idealism was not always sustained. One can easily expire bothering about moths and cleanliness and cabbages and so on. And for what purpose, she wrote in 1944, during her daughter Sarah's time in Exeter Hospital, where she was receiving treatment for osteomyelitis. In keeping with her commitment to a modern life, Hepworth was interested in new educational ideas. Bertrand and Dora Russell's Beacon Hill had closed by this point, but after the war, Hepworth sent her children to another progressive school set up in the same period, Dartington Hall. Through her letters, we still find her during school holidays, battling to meet exhibition deadlines in a house with four quarrelling children and a truculent husband. Discussion around maternity often focuses on pregnancy, nursing and the early years. But of course, Hepworth did not stop being a mother. Motherhood continued to have an impact on her emotionally, and on the time she had available to work. I shall leave it to Katie Norris to discuss motherhood in the later part of Hepworth's career tomorrow. I'd like to return to my opening question. What happens when we identify the artist as a mother? In one sense, very little. There is no shared sensibility common to artist mothers. Women and non-binary people don't suddenly transform into a homogenous block as soon as they become parents. In terms of interpretation, an artist's status as a mother should have no bearing unless the artist invites it through their words or the work itself. In Hepworth's case, she did identify her response to the world in these terms as a continuation of her strongly felt relationship to form and material. In 1952, she wrote, There is a whole range of formal perception belonging to feminine experience. So many ideas spring from an inside response to form. For example, if I see a woman carrying a child in her arms, it is not so much what I see that affects me, but what I feel within my own body. Here, Hepworth argued that in identifying an artist as a mother, 
that identifying an artist as a mother should not invalidate her from serious consideration. We might wish to add that an artist should equally not be dismissed from serious consideration for addressing mater the maternal as a subject in all of its complexity. While it is risky to become overly reliant on biography, particularly when dealing with the work of women artists, I think it important to bring the pleasures, challenges and grief of different kinds of maternal experience into view when imagining who an artist might be. To remember that for every Barbara, there is also a Babs. In identifying the artist as a mother, I would invite you to remember that great art is not only made by fatal bad boys, but also by people who have skipped studio time to look after children with bronchitis, who have suffered loss, who have, in every varied sense of the word, cared. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Hetty, for... Have I, just, have I talked for... Eight no. That's all right, actually. Perfect. Hetty was going to say, she was saying to me before, it's, it's not going to fit in, I've got so much to say, but we are perfectly on time. And it gives us also time to have a conversation um, between us and, and with everyone in the room. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of ideas and thoughts uh, bubbling up. But thank you for a talk of such range as well, because I think it was really interesting as I was listening to you to think about um, a longer history of, of um, either representations of motherhood, ideas um, about mothering. And I think that's sometimes... That's, that doesn't often happen. We sort of, again, pigeonhole these conversations in particular moments. So to see that through a history of art and a history of image making, I thought, was particularly productive and generative. So there are perhaps thoughts and questions um, around, around that as well. And um, I was particularly interested in thinking um, when you were talking about Hepworth's works in particular, about the potential of sculptural form for her as not just form or material, but as idea. And I think that really came through, that um, these are ideas being played with in sculptural form and it being such a generative place to kind of make ideas about motherhood. So that was something that I was just particularly um, struck by. And then that reading about thinking about Hepworth's work against this backdrop of the biopolitics of the early 20th century and the incredible changes that he was saying in um, political acts that change people's lives. Um, and I think, again, often we see this work as read in, within a history of art, which is about abstract form and who pierces uh, the whole first, is it Hepworth, is it more? But actually seeing that as a kind of part of this body and biopolitics. So I was just kind of really struck by that reading of interweaving Hepworth back yeah. within that Well, I particularly landscape. wanted to open it up because when I was talking to Katie about the talk, she, was, she invited me to, to respond to Motherstone, which is very much about British art. And having just done this extraordinary tour through Europe, and going around the Neue National Gallery in Berlin. And I came across this extraordinary painting of a... I mean, it looked like a riot of naked women throwing their babies into the fire. But it was, it was, it was a painting that was about one of these protests, these abortion protests mm. in, the, in, the, in 1923. And, of course, what struck me is that's 100 years ago. So this was women protesting for their reproductive so, rights yeah. 100 years ago. But that also, I, did, I had no idea about this. But, and I thought, I really felt that opening that picture up about all of these debates around maternity and the new woman, reproductive rights, population control, beyond Britain, I thought was really important as well. So I know it's a bit of a weird segue, but sorry. Mm. No, but really, <laughs> yeah, again, sort of surprising and, and, and generative. Um, and I think that idea about labour, I wanted to ask you um, about that as well, that, um, that seeing artwork, art making, and also being a parent as a form of labour, as you, know, Hep, you use those quotes from Hepworth where she talks about the chores, the kind yeah. of 
daily drudgery of, of, of this kind of living. Um, and I wondered whether you could kind of unpack that for us a yeah, bit Yeah, well, I, I was particularly struck by the bit about Leicester, actually. And it's amazing to think of somebody in 1643, and she's had this horrible experience. She's, had, she's, she's born three children who've died. She's finally got a, a child that survived. And she starts to make work again after quite a long break. But she's, you, know, you can kind of imagine her being in the room with the child and having the tulip on the kitchen table. And that's kind of... She's, she feels able to make work again, but it's only on that really small scale, having been doing these mm-hmm. much kind of more substantial genre pieces and portraits beforehand. And I think it's really amazing to think about this heritage of maternal labor. I mean, obviously, I'm sure lots of people here have been reading Silvia Frederici and, you know, that... So, I mean, this, that, I guess, Leicester was, you know, in those early years of capitalism and this expectation that um, there would be this unpaid maternal labor that it was an intrinsic part of the female condition that you would, you would do all of this unpaid domestic work and childcare and it was part of your lot in life. Mm. Um, and thinking about how that was affecting artists already, even then the earliest women artists that we look at, that was already part of their life. Mm-hmm. 